The one o'clock news is uh, temporarily delayed while we follow these live news pictures of the biggest story in Britain at the moment and the uh, one o'clock news will follow once uh, he's gone inside number 10 Dining Street. So it may be a few minutes more as the police escort finds a way up the center of the traffic there, pushing people to one side and holding it up so that the prime ministerial car can get through. He's got a fairly heavy schedule, not only making his cabinet appointments, but within a couple of weeks or so, he has to have prepared the legislation for the Queen's speech and the state opening of the new parliament. There's the budget that's been promised in July, so that uh, the time he has to relish the excitement of this moment is rather limited. All his thoughts must already be on the priorities that uh, face him, key choices in the formation of the cabinet, key decisions to be make with, made with uh, his new Chancellor of the Exchequer about the economy, the opening of the books as it's called, though they've adopted the treasury plans as they stand at the moment, they may want to re-examine those. So there's a very heavy agenda and uh, only a brief time to enjoy this moment. But for the moment, he is there to enjoy it and a huge crowd surging forward. He gets out of his car at the entrance to Downing Street. and a big crowd surging across Whitehall to his car with the police trying to hold them back. Well, up till now he's greeted crowds throughout the country during the campaign, but never can he have had scenes quite as enthusiastic as this, even if they're from many of them Labour Party supporters the huge feeling of uh, relief at the success of the party in scoring this landslide victory. Really quite overwhelming. Cherie there having to, almost to push away the hands that she shakes. And Union Jacks have been given out to everybody there. This is a an event that's been arranged by the party leadership. We're now inside Downing Street. This isn't the general public, this is people who've been invited to be here to celebrate this moment with him. And he comes to the end of the barricades and perhaps will go up the other side of the street now. Cherie, who is a barrister and is determined to pursue her own life, has been with him right through this campaign, though keeping very quiet, not playing a role like uh, Hillary Clinton played for their political mentor in the style of campaigning with President Clinton, saying you get two for the price of one. Cherie Booth, as she prefers to be called, is very much her own woman. She went to the LSE, she got a first in law, she's a practicing barrister in employment law. She's also a judge and she will be uh, returning to practice at the bar and uh, carry out her work as a judge within the week. Well, it's an overwhelming outburst of enthusiasm that we're witnessing here in 10 Downing Street and from their faces it's obvious these aren't just Labour Party members. Some of those have been invited in here but these are members of the public as well. Voters perhaps, even visitors from abroad, but a great wave of enthusiasm. Watch him pushing those hands away as he shakes them. 
you feel that both of them are going to be pulled into the crowd at any moment and passed over the crowd's heads. Neil Kinnock, did you ever see scenes like this? No, I, the only recall I have is uh, of when uh, Harold and Mary Wilson went into Downing Street in 1964. And I, I was thinking last week, I, I went into Millbank Tower, the Labour Party election headquarters, and there's a marvellous team of a couple of hundred young people there, mainly young graduates. And they were lovely to me. They all stood opposite and they were very warm in their welcome. And I said to them that I could see myself in their place in 1964 when I was working for Jim Callaghan um, in his constituency in Cardiff and we had a huge student team out. And it was almost like looking in the mirror. And you can see this absolutely genuine enthusiasm. This is no put up job. It really is warmth for a new Labour Prime Minister. Well, it's a, it's a heavy burden that he's carrying because you see here people who've clearly put their trust and confidence in new Labour and will be expecting from him exactly what he's promised there, a touching sight an old lady cheering him along, but he must be feeling all the time not just proud and pleased and excited at what he's achieved, but also that these are the people to whom he's made his promise. A reminder of the concentration of responsibility that falls on the shoulders of a British Prime Minister, quite unlike the burden that's carried by other politicians as the head of the executive ultimately responsible for pretty much everything. In a moment he'll be coming to a microphone and speaking as Mrs Thatcher did 18 years ago when she brought the Tories back into office after the years of Labour government and spoke the words of St Francis of Assisi outside number 10. Children shouting away and very excited too, and there's Cherie right in the middle of them.
for New Labour. And I say to the people of this country, we ran for office as New Labour, we will govern as New Labour. And this new Labour government will govern in the interests of all our people, the whole of this nation. That I can promise you. When I became leader of the Labour Party some three years ago, I set a series of objectives for the Labour Party. And by and large, I believe that we have achieved them. Today, we have set objectives for a new Labour government. A world-class education system in which education is not the privilege of the few, but the right of the many in our country. A new Labour government that remembers that it was the previous Labour government that formed and fashioned the welfare state and the National Health Service. It was our proudest creation it shall be our job and our duty now to modernize it for a modern world, and that we will also do. We will work in partnership with business to create the dynamic economy, the competitive economy of the future, the one that can meet the challenges of an entirely new century and new age. And it will be a government that seeks restore trust in politics in this country, that cleans it up, that decentralizes it, that gives people hope once again that politics is and should be always about the service of the public. And it shall be a government move that gives this country strength and confidence in leadership both at home and abroad, particularly in respect of Europe. It shall be a government rooted in strong values, the values of justice and progress and community, the values that have guided me all my political life, but a government ready with the courage to embrace the new ideas necessary to make those values live again for today's world. A government of practical measures in pursuit of noble causes. That is our objective for the people of Britain. Above all, we have secured a mandate to bring this nation together, to unite it, one Britain, one nation, in which our ambition for ourselves is matched by our sense of compassion and decency and duty towards other people. Simple of talking, high time to do. And uh, before he does, he's joined by his children, Ewan, the boy in the blue shirt there, and Nicholas, and in the white cap, Catherine, his daughter. The three of them and Cherie, who've never been inside number 10 before, outside their new home, and no doubt the children will rush around once they get inside and say, which room do we have, and discover that there are barely enough rooms and need to have one. But they stand now posing for the photographers. They've been kept out of the limelight, the children. Tony Blair is very protective of his family life, has always been extremely diffident about talking about it, and when in interviews he's asked about it, he always says it's something I'd prefer not to say much about. He thinks 
quite rightly, that protecting his children from this glare of publicity is the best way of allowing them to grow up with at least a half normal life when their father has just become prime minister. And they look slightly bewildered by it. And the door of number 10 opens behind him oh, and shuts again. <laughs> they seem to have changed their mind about whether he should be allowed in or not. And uh, obliging the photographers, the children move to one side. <laughs> Shouts of give her a big kiss. Shouts of give her a big hug and they... Prime Minister seems slightly uncertain about whether he should any longer obey the dictates of photographers. The advice is that he probably shouldn't, I think. and they um, thought better of the full thing. Well, this is a stupendous moment for Tony Blair, aged 44, youngest prime minister for over a century, with his children. He goes over and uh, greets some of his close family friends, supporters, 44 in four days' time, I think it is. So they go inside number 10 for the first time to be greeted by the staff and as Lord Callaghan was describing, all lined up, the staff applauding. You can see, you can just see them applauding there as he comes in. So there we are. The new Prime Minister goes into number 10. And in a moment, we'll go to the news. But just before we do, to tell you that Kenneth Clark has announced that he is a candidate for the leadership of the Conservative Party. We'll be back with more of this extraordinary and dramatic election after the news and uh, regional programs in about 40 minutes time so hope we see you again then this is bbc one now the one o'clock news with edward sturton Tony Blair has just arrived in Downing Street. As he left, John Major said he was standing down as party leader. When the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage. Good afternoon, the landslide which swept Tony Blair into office buried six cabinet ministers in the worst Conservative performance this century. It was Labour's best result ever. And the Liberal Democrats have made a mark in history too, not since Lloyd George's day has a third party held so many seats. Within the last few minutes, Tony Blair has arrived in Downing Street. He left his car at the gates and went on a walkabout, shaking hands with a crowd of well-wishers who were gathered there. Thank you.
the huge responsibility that is upon me and the great trust that the British people have placed in me. I know well what this country has voted for today. It is a mandate for new Labour, and I say to the people of this country, we ran for office as new Labour, we will govern as new Labour. The scale of Labour's victory was greater than even its most optimistic predictions and amounts to the most devastating rout of a government in living memory. For the Conservatives, it was the worst result since the 1830s. They lost six cabinet ministers and have no MPs left in Scotland or Wales. With 24 seats to declare, Labour have 418, the Conservatives 161, and the Liberal Democrats 45. The projected Labour majority is 179. Labour have won 45% of the vote, the Conservatives 31%, and the Liberal Democrats 17%. The swing to Labour is 10.5% on a turnout of 71%. Six cabinet ministers suffered humiliating defeats, Michael Portillo, Malcolm Rifkind, and Ian Lang. Also, Michael Forsyth, William Walgrave, and Tony Newton. It was after five in the morning and dawn was breaking by the time Tony Blair arrived at the Royal Festival Hall. Labour has waited 18 years for this and some of its supporters could barely contain themselves. What must have been a bittersweet moment of congratulation from the man who had to admit defeat five years ago. With all doubts about victory now gone, this had the mark of a speech to the nation as a whole. We are now today the People's Party. The party of all the people, the many, not the few. The party that belongs to every part of Britain, no matter what people's background or their creed or their colour. The party that can stand up for what is a great country. The people of Britain are uniting behind new Labour. Just across London, the scene of Conservative Central Office eerily similar to those triumphant nights of the past 18 years. There were smiles at the window where Margaret Thatcher used to acknowledge her victories. But for all the cheers, the presence of one of the high-profile casualties buried beneath the Labour landslide underlined the scale of the Conservative catastrophe. The Prime Minister paid tribute to his party team, his defeated colleagues. And on a more personal basis, though I have temporarily mislaid her, Norma. <laughs> So, right, okay, we lost. So we... <laughs> go on, John. <laughs> so go away for the weekend, relax, fire yourself up again, and then come back. Because when you come back, at the beginning of next week, we've got a job, and we better start doing it then. Thank you very much. At that stage, he was still keeping those straining at the leash for a leadership contest, guessing about his plan. Last night's race to be the first seat to declare went to Sunderland South. The count completed less than an hour after the polls closed. Christopher John Mullen, the Labour Party candidate, 27,174. It was the first tremor signalling what was to become an earthquake. Just after midnight, the first Labour gain, Birmingham Edgbaston, a marginal for the seat that the Tories have held since 1922. I'd like to thank the people of Edgbaston for entrusting me with being the first ever Labour Member of Parliament. Basildon, which gained a special place in Tory hearts when their victory there five years ago symbolised John Major's surprise comeback, went to Labour with a whopping 18% swing. And then the big names began to go. Michael Forsyth, the Scottish Secretary, was the first Minister of Cabinet rank to lose his place in the Commons. The Foreign Secretary, Malcolm Rifkin, went down in Edinburgh Pentlands. And the Scottish Nationalists claimed another senior scalp, the President of the Board of Trade, Ian Lang. In the next Parliament, there will be no Conservative MPs returned by Scotland or indeed Wales. But as the likely contenders for John Major's mantle digested what was happening, and those accustomed to office contemplated life in opposition, perhaps the biggest upset of the night. 
Twig, Stephen, Labour Party, 20,507. This time yesterday, Michael Portillo was being spoken of as one of those most likely to lead his party in the next parliament. But he won't even have a place on the back benches. Other familiar faces are going too. Dame Angela Rumbold wasn't saved by her public rebellion over a single currency. Edwina Curry can perhaps take some comfort in having been the only Conservative to make an accurate public prediction of the outcome. As the victories piled up, the Labour leader, still in his Sedgefield constituency, finally called a truce in his war against complacency. You know me, I'm never complacent, but... <laughs> no, it's looking very good all around the country. Quarter past three and Labour passed the winning post. Not an opinion poll, not even an exit poll, these were real seats in Parliament. With one of the safest seats in the country, John Major was among the few Conservatives who could arrive at the count last night, sure of staying in the Commons. I telephoned Mr Blair a little over an hour ago to congratulate him on his success and to wish him every good fortune in the great responsibilities that he will have in the years that lie ahead. The Liberal Democrats' share of the vote was pretty much what it was five years ago, but they targeted their efforts skillfully and they benefited from tactical voting. Paddy Ashdown has delivered more seats than any leader of his party since Lloyd George. And we will use that force, we will use the vote that people have given us in the next Parliament with a huge the increased number of Liberal Democrat members of Parliament to fight every minute, every second, every hour through the next Parliament for those things that we have campaigned for in this election. The Liberal Democrats had their trophy Tory to hang among their battle honours. They beat Norman Lamont in Harrogate. The Scottish Nationalists benefited from the Tory collapse too. Alex Salmon's SNP added three seats to its tally. In Wales, Plaid Cymru's position held steady. Some contests will enter political mythology. Martin Bell transformed from war correspondent to anti-sleaze campaigner and MP in a matter of weeks. David Meller perhaps making the opposite journey from politician to broadcaster. Expelled from Putney, he took consolation in the poor showing of the referendum party leader. And I'd only like just to say this to Sir James, to Sir James Goldsmith, who's got nothing to be smug about. And we have shown tonight that the referendum party is dead in the water. And Sir James, you can get off back to Mexico knowing your attempt to buy the British political system has failed. Thank you very much. As they flew down to London and power, Tony Blair's famously disciplined campaign team showed signs of relaxing. The last time the light of a post-election dawn shone on a victorious Labour leader was nearly 23 years ago. Most of those who voted for the first time yesterday weren't even born then. few hours have seen the formal transfer of office from John Major to Tony Blair. But as he left for Buckingham Palace, Mr Major had one more surprise. The unexpectedly swift confirmation that he was standing down as Conservative leader and that he wanted a reasonably brief handover period. No lengthy handover of power for a British Prime Minister less than 14 hours after the polls had closed and John Major's tenure in Downing Morning. Street was at an end. It has been uh, an immense privilege to serve as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom over the last six and a half years. It's a privilege that comes to very few people and it's a very precious privilege indeed. I hope as I leave Downing Street this morning that I can say with some accuracy that the country is in far better shape than it was when I entered Downing Street. I believe that the incoming government to whom I repeat my warm congratulations upon their success the incoming government will inherit the most benevolent set of economic statistics of any incoming government since before the First World War. And Mr Major surprised everybody with his swift announcement that he'd be stepping down from the party leadership too. When the curtain falls, it's time to get off the stage, and that is what I propose to do. I shall therefore advise my parliamentary colleagues that I believe that it would be appropriate for them to consider the selection of a new leader of the Conservative Party to lead the party through opposition during the years that lie immediately ahead. This will necessarily take a little while to organise. Parliament must meet and the members of Parliament must make their own consideration of this matter. 
Naturally, I shall remain at the service of the party during what I hope will be a reasonably brief interregnum. He said he'd keep his farewell short. He didn't want to keep Her Majesty waiting. And besides, he had things to do himself. I hope uh, that Norma and I will be able with the children to get to uh, the Oval in time for lunch and for some cricket this afternoon. There was a characteristic thank you for the policeman on duty in Downing Street and with a final public handshake for his party chairman, John Major was on his way to the palace. He'd already forsaken the prime ministerial Daimler and as he made the short journey along the Mall, the removal men were already at work at number 10. It was a coincidence that they were on their way to change the guard at Buckingham Palace too. The words he exchanged with the Queen were of course private, but he spent half an hour inside. By shortly after noon, he'd handed over the seals of office and was on his way to the cricket. At the same time, Tony Blair was preparing to begin his premiership. With a kiss for the children, the Blairs left their North London home to be welcomed by a boisterous crowd of well-wishers. Mr Blair is the tenth person to assume the office of Prime Minister under the present Queen. It's a mark of his relative youth that he wasn't even born when she ascended to the throne. But there were much younger people than him in Downing Street this lunchtime. The family and friends of Labour's key workers lined the pavements as the new Prime Minister kissed hands before making his way to number 10. He abandoned his car in Whitehall, walking into the most famous street in Britain. Outside the door, he repeated his promises to improve health and education and pledged leadership in Europe and the world. We have secured a mandate to bring this nation together, to unite it, one Britain, one nation, in which our ambition for ourselves is matched by our sense of compassion and decency and duty towards other people. It could only say it could not do. Today, we are charged with the deep responsibility of government. Today, another talking. It is time now to do. Thank you. And so, with his young family looking slightly bewildered by all the fuss, the first Labour Prime Minister to win a general election for 23 years finally crossed the threshold of number 10 Downing Street. Lance Price, BBC News, Westminster. A quick look at the rest of the news. President Mobutu of Zaire and the rebel leader Laurent Kabila are to hold peace talks today on a South African naval vessel off Angola. Nelson Mandela, who's left Pretoria to host the talks, said he was convinced both men wanted a settlement. Mr Mobutu has lost control of most of Zaire outside his capital, Kinshasa. A man who served 23 years in jail in Australia for killing four people has flown into Heathrow Archie McCafferty, who was born in Scotland, was released on parole last month and deported by the Australian authorities. And now back to Downing Street and Hugh Edwards. Hugh, dealing with the vanquished first, I understand that Kenneth Clark has already thrown his hat into the leadership ring. Yes, it appears he has, and surely the others will follow. All the key players, I expect them to throw their hats into the ring. Not today, over the weekend, Edwards. Stephen Dorrell, Michael Heseltine, Kenneth Clark, we already mentioned, John Redwood, all the rest of them, William Hague, they'll all be there. It will be a big, big, big contest. Intriguing to see how it'll work out. I rather sense the party still doesn't quite know which way it's going after the momentous events we saw here just an hour ago. And very briefly, Hugh, the next order of business for the person who's just settled in to the door behind you. Just gone in. He's meeting Sir Robin Butler, the Cabinet Secretary, now. They're deciding on the course of business. First thing is to appoint half a dozen top Cabinet Ministers. They will come by tea time today. The rest will come over the weekend. Hugh, thanks very much indeed. And that's all this Friday lunchtime from the One O'Clock News. Have a good weekend.
Good afternoon to you. Well, air conditioning is coming into its own just now. Temperature reaching 25 degrees across many central and southern parts of Britain this afternoon. It is much cooler across the north of Scotland, and that's a sign of things to come because we are going to keep the warm and humid weather in the south during the next couple of days, but then cooler conditions spreading across the whole country as we go through the holiday weekend. And indeed, it will be cold enough for some snow, especially across northern mountains. Really quite a change in our climate as we go through the next four days. We're drawing in these very warm winds up from Spain at the moment, but that'll all change. We're seeing weather fronts coming in from the Atlantic. They'll be getting more active as they become slow moving across central and northern Britain during Sunday into Monday. Well, there's the chart at the moment. That's a satellite picture showing lots of sunshine across Britain. There is some thicker cloud across the north of Scotland giving some drizzle. That's the way it's going to stay during the afternoon. I think Shetland will turn brighter and drier for a while. So unbroken sunshine, a very hot afternoon indeed, but cooling sea breezes around the coast and rather poor air quality too from northeast England southwards. Tonight then under clear skies by and large temperature down to about seven to nine degrees some patchy drizzle moving further south across Scotland and the signs of the breakdown from the Atlantic you can see here some thunderstorms never too far away from the Isles of Scilly by first light tomorrow. I think most of the rain will be moving into the west country and south Wales during Saturday probably by lunchtime quite a few showers down here otherwise fairly warm and sunny once again lots of sunshine during the morning it be different stories you go up into Scotland though, especially on the eastern side of Scotland where it's likely to stay cloudy with further patchy rain. But the showers turning increasingly wintry way up there across Orkney and Shetland. And during the second half of Saturday we'll see the odd thunderstorm breaking out over central parts of the country too. It does mean to say of course for many people it'll still be a dry day but more and more showers as you go towards the southwest. Then a drier interlude before the wetter weather returns on Saturday evening. Still very warm tomorrow then across the southern half of Britain, up to 24, 75 Fahrenheit, but quite chilly across the north, only 10 degrees probably in the northeast of Scotland, and then going down a hill on Sunday. That's it from me. million pounds plus special guests abc with their new single and caprice joining bob monkhouse for his last show and mystic meg tomorrow at the earlier time 7:45, bbc one well because of the extended coverage of election 97 earlier there's no lunchtime edition of neighbors today apologies to all ramsey street fans but of course you can catch up on all events later at the usual time 5:35. Stories from around the region now on BBC One with an extended newsroom southeast. Good afternoon. History has been made in the southeast as the Tories topple across the region, opening the door for new Labour to form a new government here at Westminster. Dancing in the streets, Labour joy as a red tide sweeps through the southeast. The fact that the Tories have gone is the most wonderful thing that could have happened in my life. Tears for the Tories as they see their heartland broken apart. A truly uh, terrible night for the Conservatives. But golden moments to cheer the Lib Dems as they hit the mark in six of their southeast targets. <laughs> Before the election, the southeast was a swathe of blue. Today, it's been repainted red. Labour are now the largest party with 85, that's up 49. The Tories have 64, that's down 57. And the Liberal Democrats have seven, up six. Some of the biggest guns in the Tory party were defeated. Defence Secretary Michael Portillo in Enfield, Dame Angela Rumbold, the Tory vice chairman in Mitcham and Morden, Transport Minister John Bowis in Battersea, and former Cabinet Minister Jonathan Aitken in Thanet South. So the opinion polls that no Labour supporter dared believe turned out to be true. The Conservatives no longer hold the majority of seats in London. Counties such as Kent and Hertfordshire have their first Labour MPs for nearly 20 years. Don Brind reports on how the Tories were driven from many of their southeast strongholds. <laughs> The frustrations of four successive election defeats and 18 years exclusion from power were washed away in a giant party on the South Bank. The fact that the Tories have gone is the most wonderful thing that could have happened in my life. 
Many of the revellers weren't born when their party last won a general election back in the mid-70s. They hope a new generation will grow up under a Labour government. Completely new beginning to British politics. Tony Blair has been sparing with his campaign promises, but the expectations he's excited are very high. I hope for choice in education and a future in Europe and a chance for us to get enthusiastic about the government again instead of being stuck with something that we've got no control over. For Tory campaigners, it was a night when the unthinkable was quickly overtaken by the incredible. A night for brave faces, the odd wry smile and untamable displays of grief at the scale of the losses. One of the biggest shocks for the Tories was in St Albans, where Labour jumped from third to first in one bound. Labour Party, 21,338. St Albans wasn't the only Hertfordshire seat where Labour were celebrating. It was one of five gains in a county where ten years ago Labour were third in every single seat. In Will in Hatfield, the defeated Tory candidate was the right-wing maverick David Evans. He blamed the government's record for his downfall. I think the government broken promises, VAT on fuel, ERM fiasco, um, couldn't get their act together on Europe. The Tory love affair with Basildon was over long before the Essex seat declared last night. When David Amis fled to a safer seat, he bequeathed the 2000 majority to John Barron. He looked on as Labour's Angela Smith turned that into a 10,000 majority. On the streets of Putney, David Meller's tabloid reputation had earned him the attentions of a candidate got up as a giant toe. And last night, a jeering Sir James Goldsmith was answered in kind. Afraid that Putney said, up your hacienda, Jimmy. The people of Kent, who haven't sent a Labour MP to Westminster for a decade and a half, added seven seats to Tony Blair's Hall. Dover, Chatham and Aylesford, Dartford, Sittingbourne and Sheppey, Medway, Gravesham, Gillingham and Thanet South. And so, by the time Tony Blair made his victory speech at the South Bank Shindig, Tory headquarters was waiting for the cleaners. Don Brind, Newsroom South East. The Liberal Democrats fared better than their supporters dared hope, picking up six of their target seats in the South East. Tactical voting appeared to play a major part in their victories, with Labour voters switching to the Lib Dem candidate to oust the Tory. James Westhead reports. At last, the breakthrough the Lib Dems have struggled for, a crucial stronghold in the South East. In Oxford West and Abingdon, Dr Evan Harris overturned a Conservative majority of 6,000 in a victory that's eluded them for 18 years. We've made a gain here, a tremendous gain, with a swing from Conservative and Labour. We've also made gains in the region, spectacular gains in the region, and we think that's because we stuck to our guns. The 9% swing in Oxford West and Abingdon was repeated in other key Lib Dem targets. In Twickenham, they ousted Toby Jessel, the Conservative MP there for a quarter of a century. Kingston, Richmond, Sutton and Carshalton also fell to the Lib Dems, consolidating their grip on south-west London. But in Richmond, in the cold light of day, one reason for the victory became clear. Many Labour voters admit they voted tactically. Their aim, simply to get rid of the Tories. I actually voted Lib Dem, though um, that's not my natural inclination, but I'll, I just wanted to get the Tories out. The only thing I, I, I could do to, to try and get uh, rid of a Tory candidate was to, to vote Liberal Democrat. I did a, a tactical vote for the uh, Liberal Democrat to get Toby Jessel out. And we did it. The Lib Dems' success is largely thanks to Paddy Ashdown's vigorous campaign, concentrated on a few target seats. His victory in the green suburbs of South London has proved Lib Dems can translate popularity in local government into seats in Parliament. James Westhead, Newsroom South East. And with me to discuss the results, first of all, uh, is Steve Norris. Now, Steve Norris, you ran the Conservative campaign in the South East. It was a disaster, fair and square. Who or what lost it for the Conservatives? Was it you? Well, I'd take my fair share of the blame. I think you have to. And I think when you really get uh, your backside licked, you've got to uh, start by having a little bit of humility uh, and, incidentally, congratulating Labour because they 
you know, when one party does badly, it requires another party to do well. I think the voters did more than just say to us that they were drifting toward Labour. I don't think it was aimless. I think the whole issue of tactical voting underlines that uh, they were actually saying, no, we don't want you anymore. Well, that's the question. Didn't you see it coming? I was on that boat going down the river with you and the Prime Minister the other day. What were you really thinking then? Uh, that we were going to lose by about 100 to 120, if you really want to know. But uh, when you're leading a team into battle, you don't say, actually, lads, you're all going to get slaughtered. That isn't the way you inspire your troops. You have to keep going right to the wire because you've got a lot of volunteers there, a lot of party workers, a lot of candidates, and they deserve that support. So, you know, I, I think my only concern privately was that the polls were resolutely not moving for us. And in those circumstances, it really was... Uh, it was defying logic to assume that the polls didn't actually have an awful lot of uh, logic in them. Tony Banks back in for Labour at West Ham. Shouldn't we, we could be forgiven, couldn't we, for being a little nervous about a government with such a majority that it can do what it likes? Well, first let me just say, I just thought that Steve uh, actually had a very good campaign in that way. I mean, I don't think that there's anything he could have done um, to have stopped the Tories going into meltdown. And so, I don't, you know, and that's because I've met him so often in so many studios during the course of the last six weeks. So I've got to say this. It's very and, big of you, but you're yeah, dodging no, the okay, question. Fine. Shouldn't no, we be not, nervous not about dodging, this not, government? Not because Mr Blair can do what he wants um, to. Yes, of course he can. Uh, no, I don't think we should be nervous. I mean, in the sense of, um, of people going in after 18 years, quite clearly, they're going to be inexperienced. But I mean, you know, the fact is, is that they're talented people. Um, it is scary, um, that's for sure, because we spent 18 years um, telling the Tories where they were getting it wrong. Now we're there, and we're going to have to start getting it right. That's scary. We'll come back to you later. But uh, Jenny Tong, uh, newly elected for the Lib Dems in Richmond Park. Let's just deal with this. It was tactical voting, wasn't it, that won it for the Lib Dems rather than core support? And isn't the evidence <coughs> for that that the swing to the Lib Dems in the marginal seats in the South East was much bigger than the swing across the country? Well, there's two elements. First of all, we built on a very hard core of Lib Dem voting that's been there for a long, long time while we've been trying to win those seats. Secondly, yes, of course, and we're very grateful for a lot of Labour supporters who voted tactically. But, you know, there were a lot of Conservatives, too, who voted for us this time. And the reason was that they just didn't like what was happening to public services, and we were the party that was sticking up for them. So, you know, I think there were several... Um, factors in our victory, but it wasn't just tactical voting. Well, this is a debate that will continue across the river. Of course, we will move on and I hope come back to you in a minute. Thank you. Whether in defeat or victory last night, candidates were certainly put through the emotional ringer. We have two reports now taking you through the night with a winner and a loser. First, Sarah Harris watched how the usually flamboyant Jerry Hayes handled being ousted from Harlow in Essex. We ain't getting much <laughs> Jerry Hayes knew he was facing defeat as he arrived at the sports centre in Harlow last night, but he was taking it in his stride. Even the size of the swing against him didn't seem to wipe the smile off his face. Bye bye, Jerry. Bye bye. Joseph James Jeremy Hayes, Conservative candidate, 15,347. William Ernest Rammel, the Labour Party candidate, 25,000. <laughs> It's been a hard campaign for him. While canvassing, he was attacked by a dog and punched in the face. But he didn't think his recent bad fortune, including allegations about his private life, had any bearing on the result. Well, I don't think so. I mean, you know, when you look at the number of Tories who've bitten the dust tonight and there are no allegations against them, no, I don't think that's made a heck of a difference at all. People are far, far, far more sensible than that. He said he wasn't going to point the finger of blame for the Conservatives' defeat. Unless it was Melbourne persuaded. And would you like me to name them? Go ahead. Obviously. Theresa Gorman, Bill Cash, the Eurosceptics. He's hoping to continue okay. his career in journalism and not being one to avoid the you limelight. It the doesn't media. seem likely this is the last we'll see of Jerry Hayes. Sarah Harris, the, uh, Newsroom Southeast, BBC, Harlow. Thanks very much. And now I'm going to have a sleep. <laughs> <laughs> In Brentford and Isleworth, the mood was very different. The new Labour MP, Anne Keane, received a rapturous welcome from supporters. Even the most optimistic hadn't their dream of the 15,000 majority the voters delivered. Keane and 32,000. But when the results came through earlier in the evening, the celebrations were tinged with relief. It was third time lucky for Anne Keane. Having lost her seat for the second time in 1992, she was left to watch as her husband Alan clinched victory in the neighbouring constituency. But this time, it was a double celebration. 
Well, we'll see more of each other in the daytime and the evening. That's, that's for certain. At least I'll know where he right. is, won't I? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anne Keane will join her husband in Parliament when she is sworn in next Wednesday. But do the Keane supporters think a married couple wedded to a political life is a good idea? It's an advantage um, because the ha commitments that uh, a relationship involves for a couple, uh, they understand the issues. Oh, wonderful, yes, yes, especially in neighbouring constituencies because they can deal with all the, uh, the borough's uh, problems, you know. <laughs> And it wasn't just the Keens who were partying last night. Anne's sister also won a seat. It seems that when it comes to politics, it's best to keep it in the family. Jasmine Butter, Newsroom South East. Well, the general election isn't the only voting that's been going on. The results for the county council elections are now coming in, and ironically, they show the Tories fighting back across the home counties. Our local government correspondent, Andy Hoskin, is at Maidstone in Kent, where the Conservatives have regained their hold on power. Andy, thanks for joining us. Many people will have been confused by being asked to put down more than one cross. Can you just explain what's going on? Well, it's quite extraordinary, really. Despite what's happening nationally, the Tories are sweeping back to power in the home counties. They're getting back all those councils they lost four years ago, and an extraordinary local election result then. For example, in Kent, that's gone from no overall control now to Conservative, albeit by one, one seat majority. In Surrey, a 10% swing to the Tories looks like putting them back in power at uh, Surrey County Hall. In Essex, we're getting the same picture, although it's too early yet to say what the whole picture is. In Hertfordshire, again, the Tories look like regaining County Hall there. And in Bedfordshire, the Tories have actually taken Bedfordshire County Council for the first time since 1979. So, Andy, explain to us why the Conservatives seem to be doing so well and what difference that will make to the balance of power. How does it square with the Conservative meltdown in the country as a whole? Well, it's really extraordinary because in 1993, the last time these county elections were fought, uh, the Tories lost control of, of Kent and Surrey for the first time in 100 years, and that was really because of a low turnout of about 35%. This time round, there's been a high turnout, and the Tories in the rural areas who stayed away last time in 1993 have come out and that's made all the difference and the Tories seem to be getting back those areas which they really should hold and in fact which they held, they have hung on to really in the general election. All right Andrew, thank you very much. We'll take more from you later I know. Thank you. So what will a new Labour government mean for us here in the South East? The clues can be found in the party's manifesto. Sean Lay now reports on whether new Labour really offers a new future. Small wonder after 18 years of impotence that Labour supporters celebrated well into the early hours. But after the hangovers clear, they face a bigger headache, turning policies into action. Labour MPs in London will receive an envelope stuffed with constituents' complaints about the underground, part of a lobbying exercise by business organisation London First. They've reservations about the manifesto promise to revitalise the so-called private finance initiative, or PFI, to put private money into the tube. The PFI uh, has not had the right conditions for many people. They've walked away from deals, or deals have stalled, and not just in transport. So the Labour Party now has got a big job to do, to look at changing the PFI into what they call public-private partnerships that work for the private sector. Private money was also considered to help keep open London's hospitals, but although there'll be no further closures pending a review, no guarantees have been given to satisfy the Barts campaigners, and other parties doubt if Labour's promised savings from cutting bureaucracy will be enough to stave off some closures. The truth of the matter is that the current proposals project too many bed closures, too few services. In order to keep the services we need, we will almost certainly need more money. Labour has promised that a new directly elected mayor and London-wide council needn't mean the end of the Lord Mayor of London. But some Labour councillors fear an elected mayor would be competition for them. To go now into the business of getting an elected mayor that could be quite completely different, it could be one of the cowboy types, you know, one of the big boys with big hats and running through the... Uh, some of them would not really have much idea of running a council. A new elected council would also be responsible for policing, extending the zero tolerance experiment carried out in King's Cross. Labour claims a crackdown on relatively minor offences like graffiti will stop people drifting into more serious crime. 
One chief constable in the region has warned it may provoke riots unless zero tolerance is matched with more positive anti-crime initiatives. In that way you'll have a sustained reduction in crime which will last rather than a quick fix solution which might, might then cause serious problems in the longer term. The new government won't tolerate the workfare programme piloted in Kent, the county with the highest unemployment outside London. Labour promises to get a quarter of a million youngsters into work, but no one is sure what effect a minimum wage may have in forcing some of the region's farming and tourism businesses to lay off staff. The party slogan, things can only get better, will make it hard to suppress expectations. In the coming days, it may dawn on Labour's supporters that improvement depends on confronting difficult choices. Sean Lay, Newsroom, South East. Well, let's put some of that now to Tony Banks. Tony Banks, what does Tony Blair mean when he says uh, he will be more radical in government than anyone expects? The reason I ask is that we hear Ken Livingston is already saying, put up tax. Is that the sort of well, thing Well, let's get something quite clear. There's no way that Tony Blair would put up either the basic rate or the top rate. I mean, he'd rather see people sort of die in the streets, as it were, metaphorically speaking, than actually break a promise, because he saw the damage that it did to uh, John Major by promising not to increase taxes, then doing exactly the opposite. But there are lots of other taxes that one can look at in terms of business taxes or petrol or whatever. So we're definitely going to have to find money. We're, the we're supposed to be comforted by that assurance, are well, we? Well, whether you are or whether you're not, I mean, Blair will deliver, and he's got the majority to deliver. I mean, he could walk across the Thames here, you know, without getting his feet wet. But the point is this, that we have to deliver in terms of the constitutional side, because that's where the real radicalism of a Blair government's going to come. Economically, I think, conservative with a small c. And the constitution, getting elected mayors in London and elsewhere, getting those sort of constitutional changes through. A wonderfully radical prime minister, probably the most radical we've had this century. But that has to be the question I have to ask you to be brief. Can you deliver? You have this massive majority. The expectations will be enormous. Yeah. You know all the things that concern Londoners, yet you're within the previous government's spending limits. How can you deliver? We have got to deliver, and we've got to do so by looking at the ways that we can change spending priorities within the existing um, programme. And there will be some room for tax changes, but of course it won't be on the question of basic rate or top rate of income tax. But we've got to deliver, because Blair said we're going to deliver, and with his sort of majority, it means we're going to have to do it. Tony Banks, thank you. We, will, we shall see, won't we? Thank you. A reminder of the election headlines in the southeast, where there's been a political transformation across the region. Kent and Hertfordshire have their first Labour MPs for nearly 20 years after the Tories were driven from many of their traditional strongholds. People in Kent have lost faith. They feel betrayed by the outgoing government. They feel let down and they're looking for change. The Conservatives no longer hold the majority of seats in London. The Liberal Democrats have fared better than their supporters dared hope picking up six of their target seats. Tactical voting appeared to play a major part in their victories, with Labour voters switching to the Lib Dems to oust Tories. And our political correspondent, Jonathan Beale, joins us now. Well, that is still the question, isn't it? Labour, with this massive majority, this enormous expectation, how can they possibly meet demands? Well, they're under pressure to deliver because they promised a number of things, like uh, local government for London. Uh, they promised um, a review of the health service. Now, if we look at what happened in Edgware, um, two Tory MPs largely deposed to a great extent because um, the government failed to keep Edgware Hospital open. If Labour doesn't review that, and if it doesn't give it the answers that the people there voted and want, then they may find themselves being unpopular. They've got to deliver. Uh, just move for a minute to the Lib Liberal Democrats. A great result, and they're calling themselves the new opposition in Parliament. And yet, there is no real opposition, isn't there? Labour can do what they like. Uh, Tony Blair can even do what he likes in his own party. Uh, Ken Livingstone, you mentioned, calling for, for higher taxes. Tony Blair can ignore that. He has got such a majority that he can do what he wants to. Uh, briefly, and, and this question centres on the question of whether there was core voting going on or whether there was real tactical voting going on. Did anyone really expect the electorate to be as sophisticated as it seems to have been? I think this election has shown that the electorate is very sophisticated. If we see what happened in Hertfordshire, where people didn't vote for the Liberal Democrats, which were the naturally second, natural second party, and voted for Labour instead, I think the electorate is a lot more sophisticated than people took them, believe them for, to be. All right, well, Jonathan, thank you very much. Um, we shall have another... I have a camera somewhere. Hello. We have another a program at 7 o'clock this evening, but that is it from us from here for now.
next film star is discovered shot dead in a sealed nuclear bunker built 30 feet underground in a rock face of solid granite. The thick steel plate door is locked from the inside, but it looks like murder. Welcome to the world of Jonathan Creek, beginning May the 10th on BBC One. Because of the extended coverage of Election 97 earlier, there was no lunchtime edition of Neighbours Today. Apologies to all Ramsey Street fans, but of course you can catch up on all the latest events at the usual time, 5.35. And on BB1 now, time for more Election 97 news with David Dimbleby.